Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor College of Medicine. I mean, what a week again. Uh, first of all, it's my sister's birthday. That was the most important thing. And I'm wearing a tie today. It shocked everybody because uh, my sister liked the tie last week. So that's why I'm wearing a tie. But not to be outdone, the White House, what a mess. Infections everywhere. Uh, talk about not being able to contact Trace. I mean, that's just, it's kind of un unbelievable. Of course, not to be outdone, the CDC <laughs> once again flipped. Remember last week we were talking about no aerosolization, and I said it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that there's aerosolization. Well, guess what? They decided this week aerosols really do exist. But just to add to the utter chaos, uh, they released recommendations on how to clean rooms that are like you got to sit and wait for 24 hours before you can even go in. Well, that's measles. That's not COVID-19 and masks work. So if you have a room with people and you need to go in to clean it, wear a mask and gloves. It's like ridiculous. So I expect them to be able to reverse that recommendation uh, next week. But you know, let's wait and see what happens. It's always fun. I'll say, I, let's go over the TMC data. I like to do that every week. Uh, it's pretty good news, not perfect, pretty good. Uh, the effective uh, reproduction number is under one. It's been creeping up slowly, but it's still under one, which is a good thing. We're still winning the battle there. The test positivity rate for our uh, nine county region continues to fall. It's almost down, uh, it's down to under 4% again, which is very good. And our test, uh, in our new cases, it's been generally between three and 400, continues to be in that, re in that region. I'd like it to be under 200. Remember, we're shooting between 5 and 10 per 100,000. It's okay, but it's not great. And unfortunately, uh, what I'm really worried about is I've heard some uh, rumblings from the state and the, and the governor that things are looking really good. And when we see things looking really good, there's a tendency to want to put your foot on the gas. And all I would remind everyone is that the upper Midwest is not in the, it's in a surge. I mean, it's a disaster. The Dakotas, Minnesota, Wisconsin now is setting records for hospitalizations. Uh, they got comfortable with their, their numbers and they started opening up too fast. I am hopeful that we in Texas are smarter than that. Our goal should be let's open schools before we open bars and restaurants. And I, I really want to uh, remind people the way we control this is physical distancing and wearing masks. Let's just keep doing it until we get schools open and we get some weeks behind us and know what we're doing. So once again, uh, some great science, just some fascinating science. And this week, uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, you'll remember last week we were talking about what was responsible for the severity of outcomes. And we're 10% of, of uh, people who had really bad uh, or serious reactions had autoantibodies to an important chemical in the body, interferons, which are responsible for sort of the general immune response. Well, last week there was a pub paper published in Nature on Neanderthals. Now, how, does, how do Neanderthals have anything to do with COVID-19? So early on uh, in the COVID epidemic, it was, or pandemic, it was very clear that age was a risk factor, that male sex uh, and comorbidities such as hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes were really problems that would likely induce a bad outcome. There were also two genomic regions that were identified, one on chromosome three that contained six genes, and one on chromosome nine that contained the ABO blood groups. Now the ABO blood groups have not really turned out to be all that strong a relationship, but it does appear that, the, that, that chromosome three is really important. And the region on chromosome three entered modern humans from a gene flow from Neanderthals that lived mainly in Eurasia in the region of Croatia. Now that haplotype, if you have that gene, you have a 60% increase in having a really, really bad outcome. Uh, you know, we don't know why, but it's really interesting. The other fascinating thing is South Asians have a gene frequency of about 30% of having this Neanderthal ha haplotype. The highest frequency of the Neanderthal haplotype occurs in Bangladesh with over 50% of people with Bangladesh origin carrying that particular haplotype. Now what is the impact of that? 
Bangladeshis in the United Kingdom have twice the risk of dying from COVID-19 than the general population. The other fascinating thing is when you look at East Asians, they almost have zero incidence of this haplotype. You know how we're always saying, look, Singapore has done great or Hong Kong is doing better. Well, there may be a reason for that because they seem to be a lot less susceptible to the really serious outcomes of COVID-19. So how could Neanderthals have anything to do with viruses and why is it relevant to COVID-19? And first, I'm going to have to make a heartfelt apology to archaeologists and evolutionary scientists. I'm sure I'm going to say things that are make no sense to anybody uh, but me and my own you know, strange mind. But let's take a walk through geologic history. Uh, the Earth formed about four and a half billion years ago. It looks like we have about seven and a half billion years to go before we're engulfed by a dying sun. Microorganisms formed in the ocean about three to four billion years ago, and dinosaurs roamed the Earth from 233 million years ago to about 66. Uh, all that's left of them, of course, are crocodiles and turtles and a few birds in the backyard. Seven million years ago, bipedalism, or walking on two feet, was the first major adaptation that began the evolution to humans. And our first lineage, Homo habilis, evolved about 2.8 million years ago. Now, Neanderthals lived in what it was Eurasia, and modern humans split from a common ancestor between 350,000 and 400,000 years ago, but there was a gene flow from interbreeding about 100,000 years ago between Neanderthals and modern man. And there was a paper in Nature in 2014 by Higgum et al. that shows that Neanderthals dominated Europe, dominated, and then became extinct 40,000 years ago, and there was about a 5,000 year overlap with modern humans. So, so what happened? Well, many, many hypotheses. There was a hypothesis that was violence with modern humans, competitive exclusion, extinction by interbreeding. And one of the most interesting possibilities is that Neanderthals were susceptible to some really serious infectious diseases and that they couldn't get through that evolutionary window, whereas modern man could. And it may well be that th these Neanderthals were very susceptible to viruses and that gene, that, that haplotype that was transferred some 40,000 years ago is responsible for the weakness in our ability to handle COVID-19. Now think about if Neanderthals had masks. They might be walking around here and we wouldn't be here. So there's a lesson for us in our species. Don't be a Neanderthal. Wear a mask. I think that's pretty clear. So now it's our favorite time for shout outs. Uh, first of all, uh, this is PA week, so I wanna do a special shout out for all of our PA students and faculty. They're a very key part of our healthcare uh, team and they're one of the top schools in the country. I also wanna give a special shout out, shout out to Susan Moseberg who won her second NIH Pioneer Award. And then the third shout out is to Laura and John Arnold who have provided support for our COVID educational outreach curriculum for K through 12 students. That's almost completed. Our back to school guide is already on BioEd line. Uh, so very, very excited about that. And then finally, we are observing National Diversity Week. Uh, as you know, diversity is extremely important to us here at Baylor. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's because it makes us better. It's an advantage. Diversity and inclusion provide an advantage. You can solve problems much better when you have diverse views and you include those views. And we put out a position paper on strengthening our commitment to racial justice as a matter of public health. And there were five principles uh, that we put out and we were very, very excited about that. That's an institutional position paper. And this week we're gonna close with a video of members in our community talking about what diversity means to them. So uh, interesting week, it's always fascinating, tremendous science. Wear your mask, don't be a Neanderthal, and have a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you next week. So for me, diversity means much more than just numbers. Diversity, or true diversity, can only happen when people engage with and embrace what makes us different. I think that diversity is among the most valuable assets that we have to expand our toolkit for solving problems. 
Diversity of ideas is hard to measure and see, but what you can see is people who are willing to start conversations even though they don't agree with you in the beginning. It doesn't matter if it's science, politics, as long as someone is willing to start a conversation with you, I believe that is diversity. And I have had those experiences in Baylor. We actually had a grand round that was fantastic and uh, the speaker made a point to say it doesn't really matter like whether you have every color of person like in your program. I want to walk into the cafeteria and see who's sitting with who. And I think it's really, really important to once you now have this diverse population of people, it's important to make them feel welcome and um, put together programs and opportunities for people to feel like they're a part of a family. Well, I'm a proud gay Latino. Um, and so I feel like I am the epitome of diversity. I'm someone, uh, while growing up or going through my career, I didn't really see people like me representing me. And so one of the things that I wanna do is be that person for others. And at the end of the day, learning about each other, learning about each other's backgrounds will help us understand our patients better, help us understand uh, the patient's problems better and therefore be able to provide better health care. If you had just a group of people that they all think the same, if there was a problem that need to, needed to be seen in a different light, it would be a very myopic view that they all bring to that problem. But when you have people from you know, that come from different backgrounds and that see things differently and learn how to do things differently. You can easily incorporate other people's experiences into a problem and I think reach a solution much faster than if you had everyone thinking the same way. An environment that is rich with people of diverse backgrounds allows for interactions that are more creative and more innovative. Science and medicine are highly competitive fields, so that innovative edge is what makes forward motion possible. On the practice level, an environment that cherishes differences, nurtures graduates, clinicians, and researchers who have a deeper insight into the human condition. When it comes to translating science into practice and identifying social determinants of health, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. The way forward is with those who have eyes that can probe the root causes of medical and social problems. For example, who better than a scientist or clinician with arthritis could understand the real-life link between obesity and arthritis? Diversity and inclusion were definitely things that were of huge interest to me as I looked at potential opportunities in, in academic medicine. I think there's a, a huge value and really something frankly that's very powerful when you can see people that look like you, when you can interact with people that may have similar backgrounds as you, especially when those people are your colleagues or even in leadership positions. I think they serve as great role models and really an example of success that you too can also try for. From my personal perspective as um, an out gay woman, I always found a lot of uh, support here at Baylor um, in, in all regards. And uh, I think diversity really is a part of the thread that runs through Baylor and I kind of see it everywhere. And that's what, what really convinced me that this is, this is the place for me. I don't like working with um, somewhere only one type of person. I want working somewhere is have all kind of people are working together. I sit in front desk, I see the all kind of people coming to us college. Uh, doesn't matter what color they are and it doesn't matter uh, where they come from. And then they are smart and they are nice and then they're more than welcome to work for Baylor.